from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Dr. Harris, welcome to True News. Thank you very much for having me on your program. Dr. Harris, can you give us a, an eyewitness account of what you're seeing there in Freetown? I think it's certainly true to say that the virus is well ahead of us. It's been racing ahead of us and it's been tricking us and it's not been responding to traditional measures. One of the problems was we had got this virus and the things we did in the past worked well. So when it started behaving or entered populations that were quite different from the populations that we were used to managing outbreaks in, uh, it got the jump on us. There's no doubt about it. I think it's unfair to say we're operating on bureaucracy time. That may have been fair to say a few months ago. Right now, things are moving extremely quickly. We've got the military on the ground. We've got U.S. military in Liberia, and we've got the British military here in Sierra Leone. And they are moving with tremendous speed because they are very good at making things happen. One of the reasons things have been too slow is that they're simply people physically, working with teams, following up teams, supporting teams to make sure things like safe burials happen. So people have been waiting with bodies in their houses for days, which is just not acceptable. Or people who have been become ill and, and realise that it's likely to be Ebola in the parts of Freetown we've been talking about, go to the hospital as they're instructed to do, go to the hospital as early as possible, but the hospital is full. They go to the next hospital, that hospital is full. So it's it's filling the hospitals, it's filling the treatment centres and leaving the people who get, get sick later with nowhere to go. So we've had to really change our strategy. I understand that 1,000 makeshift Ebola clinics are being uh, built in Sierra Leone Now, my understanding is that there will not be treatment at these clinics, but this is basically to get the sick people out of their homes and away from their family members and and neighbors so that they don't spread the disease. So even even with these clinics, um, there's still going to be a large number of deaths in the weeks and months to come, right? Actually, they will be treated in those clinics. So that's not um, a a correct perception. You are absolutely right with the second thing you said, which which is that the aim is to get people out of their homes um, and into uh, a safe place where they will not infect other people. That's absolutely true. But you can't just move people into a place and not treat them. These are very, very sick people. You have to provide oral rehydration salts, that's fluids, to um, resuscitate them because one of the big things that happens is they lose enormous amounts of fluid. And in the early stages of the disease, people can drink well. So if you can get that fluid into them, you can make an enormous difference. I've just seen a family of three. I saw them loaded into the ambulance 10 days ago. The little boy particularly was so ill. He had diarrhea. He he wasn't wearing any pants because he was fouling himself so often. He had blood coming from his ears. All the signs of somebody who really wasn't going to do well with Ebola. I seen. I saw him yesterday. I didn't recognize him. He looked twice the size. He looked like a different person because he lived. And he simply got to just a local village health centre and the local people gave him oral rehydration salts, gave him the care um, and he recovered along with his sister and his aunt. Um, Do do, do children, Dr. Harris, do children and young people have a better chance of surviving because their immune system is stronger? That's not clear at this point. Um, We are collecting information, but because, again, we're racing to contain the virus, a lot of that analysis and understanding of how it's working in some people versus others is not really clear. What we do know is that the group that are most affected seem to be young adults. So it's people from the ages of between 15 and 45. And as you can quickly work out, I'm sure, that means that you are sucking out the group that are, that are the most economically productive group in, in a society. You're just taking away all the workers, all the doers, all the producers. And, and that's a, a horrendous loss. 
apart from the fact that loss of any life is terrible, you're also removing the future of the country. What is uh, what has been the effect on the the medical services of Sierra Leone? I I, I read yesterday that uh, hundreds of of doctors, nurses, medical workers have died so far. What, what impact is it having on the medical sort of the infrastructure? Services, absolutely. Yeah, they're utterly overwhelmed. And as you quite rightly say, there weren't many doctors and nurses before the outbreak occurred. Um, we've seen 100, over 120 healthcare workers infected, and most of them have died. Nearly, nearly 100 of them have died. So that's a horrendous loss. Um, and that also means that there simply aren't people to look after after the sick. And and this is why it's this is such a difficult disease to deal with because you can't just swoop in there and do something very quickly. You have to make sure the people who are caring for the ill are protected. When you see somebody so ill in front of you like that, as I was describing that little boy, he couldn't even get into the ambulance, but I couldn't pick him up and put him in the ambulance because if I did that, then I was infecting myself and causing all sorts of problems for my colleagues. So you're in a situation where you want to do everything you can for people, but your kindness would be the most harmful thing you could do. Um, so it's, it's, it's completely different. It's a very, very cruel virus from that point of view because the people who look after the sick are the people who genu- you know, who are driven to help, and yet they have to think of protecting themselves uh, do- all the time at, at first. Dr. Harris, when these uh, 1,000 clinics are put up, will everybody working in these clinics be wearing uh, biosafety level 4 uh, protective suits? Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Um, that is part... Of, and that's why it's taken a little longer than we'd like it to have taken because we've got to make sure everybody's trained, everybody has those biosafety suits, and the supplies of those suits will always reach them. So it's no good saying to somebody, here's your suit, go away. I mean, you have to keep on changing them. Every time you leave the, uh, the bedside, you have to take it all off and dispose of it. So you go through vast amounts of this stuff. Um, and we have to make sure vast amounts of this stuff are available to everybody looking after anyone with Ebola because we've got to stop transmission at all levels and we've got to make sure that, that those marvellous people who look after the sick are as protected as possible. But I'll tell you, there's one group that can work in Ebola clinics and can work in the community clinics with, with high, greater safety, and that is the survivors. So we're now seeing a lot of survivors. They're struggling to go back to their communities because there is a lot of stigmatization. Um, And we're now looking at training survivors to work within the clinics because they are actually protected by their own antibodies. We will still give them um, personal protective gear, but they're in a better position to help those who are ill than anybody else in the the country. Are are you seeing bodies alongside roads and streets? I am, unfortunately. I'm not seeing, uh, you know, you, you don't see bodies everywhere. That's, mm-hmm. that's an incorrect perception. You, you may see, for instance, a body in the road because the community is very, very angry about that body not being buried. Uh, this is a country where people expect to bury their, their loved ones very quickly after death. And if they're being made to wait four days, it's beyond, it's totally unacceptable. So the community may actually put the body in the street because they're angry about the fact mm-hmm. that, that, that burial services have not arrived. Or they may be frightened that their village or their home is going to be quarantined. So when somebody dies, they'll simply put the body in the street somewhere a, a long way from where they are in order not to then be quarantined. Uh, the two infections you, you talk about spread very, very differently from the way Ebola spreads. They both were uh, infections that could spread through the air. Now, Ebola does not. It spreads through direct contact with body fluids. So when you actually analyse how many people one person has infected, it's only one to two other people. The problem is that... Um, 
that once those people are infected, they become very ill. Uh, they become ill and they have not been managed and they have then infected two to three other people. And we did have some extensive infections in the early days because of the nature of burial ceremonies where everybody touched the corpse. They even washed themselves in the water that had been used to wash the corpse. So we had m much greater infection levels because of those practices as well. Now, these are not widespread practices in most countries. And the other important thing to remember is that there is fantastic, there is, there has been great preparedness in other countries. We declared this a public health emergency of international concern in early August, and countries around the world have been preparing and preparing solidly for the arrival of any cases. And that's what we're seeing now. When cases or potential cases have arrived in other countries, those countries have swung into action, as your country has, um, swung into action very rapidly and, and, and identified all the contacts and taken the appropriate actions to make sure those people, if infected, have no chance of infecting other people. So we saw that even two African countries, once alerted and once aware of um, the infections in their own countries, have been able to stop that transmission. So it's not nearly as effective at spreading itself as those two other um, uh Infection, infectious agents you described. Mm -hmm. you, um, you, you mentioned that e Ebola is not spread uh, through the air, but, but I did read a U.S. Army. Right. I read a report by the U.S. Army uh, Institute of Infectious Diseases at Fort Detrick, Maryland, and it, it mentioned uh, filoviruses such as Ebola that, that could spread in cold weather climates because of coughing and sneezing. So if it gets into the northern hemisphere during the winter time, aren't, isn't there a possibility that, that we could see um, a, a much wider distribution of the Ebola virus? Uh, you're talking about drop, droplet spread, and that is, again, spread when somebody coughs and sneezes, as you say, and they, and they cough out some droplets, mm -hmm. as we, we, we saw in something like SARS. But... Again, it, it's a virus that doesn't survive very long once you, 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 you cough it outside. I mean, you really need to touch um, the infected person and touch the body fluids. Um, or, and they have to enter an open sore or your mouth or your eye. So there has to be some, first of all, some touch and then some movement into your, your mouth or your eye. But the other thing, that the, the other big difference there is... Um, Sneezing and coughing are not classical. We just don't see them in Ebola. I've got a list of symptoms in front of me, and sneezing and coughing are very rare symptoms. Yes, but um, but but so, um, but I think what this report was saying is that uh, Ebola so far has been has been confined to Africa, primarily the Congo. But if it ever got into cold weather climates, because of uh, people catching colds and flu, if they had Ebola, there was the potential for it to be spread through coughing and sneezing. I think that's what the report was saying. Yeah, I think it's, that's quite a long bow. Uh, it's an extrapolation and there's no scientific evidence. It's, it's theoretical and, I, you know, mm -hmm. good, good scientists and good clinicians always put theories around. That's how, how we move our ideas forward. But there is no evidence of this. What, one last question. What, what do you think will be the tipping point in the coming weeks or months when world leaders say we have to go into very severe emergency measures? Well, I think we're seeing the world leaders understand how serious this is now. We're, 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 we're seeing a huge response, and we haven't seen that before. Now we're seeing it. And I believe this is what's needed uh, we need lots of people on the ground. We need lots of equipment. We need lots of supplies. And we need lots and lots of energy. It's one of those things. Ebola doesn't take a holiday. It doesn't take a rest. And we can't do that either. So we need lots of people because the people working so hard need to be replaced regularly. But we can do it if we do it all together. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. You can visit us on www.therealthingmean.webs.com.